Welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with Pat Lowinger, who is a two-time master coming up, getting his PhD. And even if you didn't have that, I think you're still an expert. And uh, the reason why I think that is from, I was looking into your website from WordPress, and you had just loads and loads of knowledge of ancient mythology, ancient history, comparative religion stuff. All that good stuff is in there. So you should check that out. I will put the link in the description. I might have already put Yeah, it's already in there, actually. That's in the description. Check that out. It is a awesome website. The, the archives go back to 2016, and it's just tons of great articles on stuff that this channel gets into. So if you like this, you'll like that. Also, another thing you will as well enjoy I gotta share another thing real quick is um this channel right here can you see this okay this is bitty buddhist channel and uh make sure you subscribe hit that bell pat is on here all the time like a lot how many times have you been on here like i'm, I'm the i'm the co-host yeah so. you're the co-host there you go yeah so there there is he there he is right there on the uh banner awesome show i watch it all the time gets into the same stuff that this channel is getting into it's just another channel like like mine if you like my channel you like this channel hit the bell subscribe go ahead and binge watch that enjoy thank me later and um yeah what's going on well thanks for having me um um i i'm again i'm i'm a long ways from my phd so let's not make it sound like it's coming around the corner yeah, um, sure 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 you know. fair enough fair enough but yeah you do know what you do you do you are an expert in my opinion and we were talking discussing on what topics we can get into and one of the things we were talking about was uh was mary beard's book religions of rome right who i think is arguably the goat i think she's arguably the goat in, in comparative religion so yes, I, uh, Dr. Beard's an outstanding scholar. I'm hoping that you can have her on your story. But again, like we were talking about, you can't just read Mary Beard's book. You got to read the people she says she's disagreeing with, sure. so you can understand. And uh, Dr. Beard, um, I'm a big fan. You know, when it comes to comparative mystery cults uh, like Hugh Bowden, right? These other big people out there that are that again. Um, really studying this stuff, getting as much information as possible, but Beard's great. Um, but there are other people too that I, I've always said, if someone like Dr. Beard is citing someone, you need to read that source. 
Right. Like, like, because those are she's saying, well, this is who I rely upon. Yep, <laughs> and if, and at that point, it's it it tells you that, you know, it's the stamp of approval, so to speak. And one of the things I noticed about her is she likes to go around and like she, for example, she'll find a graveyard somewhere in Rome and be like, this, this, uh, you know, this pillar right here says this. And like, this is, uh, this is evidence that they were doing that. Like she goes into the, to the weeds and finds things that she's not just looking at scripture. She's looking at artifacts and archaeology. She's looking at little, little engravings that you find in the middle of a country somewhere. And she writes a lot about this great mother, Cabela which we're about to get into. Um, for, for anyone who has no idea what the Great Mother is, why don't you tell us about this? And so, we'll open there. so this concept of a Great Mother, if we're going to tie it back to, we're going to talk about the Greek goddess Kybele, but Greek goddess Kybele has several forebears, um, particularly in Anatolia, modern Turkey, southern Anatolia, um, an area known as ancient Phrygia. Now, um, going back to the Neolithic period, there and forward through the Bronze Age, there appeared to have been a cultic practice established, worship of a divine mother. Now, that practice was the first and only um, depicted form, atropopeic uh, form of her, In uh, the only deity actually was feminine, and she was known as the Great Mother, the Mother of the Mountains. And th that's where most people go, well, Kybele, uh, the Great Mother, Mater, um, probably in her, her original language, um, or Mater, Depends on how you want to say it. Um, a scholar named Brigitte Bow is kind of really serious about we have to call her by her proper name, which is probably ma uh, Mater, right? That's the closest language that we'd have a parallel to in the original Phrygian. But she's depicted in like niches on the sides of mountains, basically carved temple complexes, if you want to think about that. But they're more associated with like hollowed out caves, but it, it's but basically statuary depicting this goddess to the 8th and 7th century BCE long before she was imported into main areas um, of Athens and later Rome in the uh, late third century BCE. So she's definitely Anatolian, Phrygian in origin. She's imported and adopted in the Greeks and the Greeks spread her throughout various parts of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And she's kind of all that in a bag of chips in my idea is how you can understand religion and follow cultic development, both from its indigenous form and then adopted and then transported forms outside the regions where this occurs. And um, we were talking before the show, so I'm, I'm going to stop talking now because I'm already ready to go. No. Yeah. And that, that's a good little rundown of who this is. Um, so like you, like you mentioned, she, it looks like her origins come from the Phrygians, the ancient Phrygians, even going back to, I think I'm pronouncing this wrong. Quetzalhuic culture. Right. And the again, that, and that I agree with you that there's, some strong indications that a divine feminine mother form was already established in the region. Now, how that actually grows into the great mother cult or um, that there, you know, we have yeah. to you, allow for some anthropological development, sure. but we can, we, in that region, the association with the divine feminine being a supreme deity, so to speak is important. And that's, that's important to remember too, because in a Greek context, she's of Reduced association in the mainland of Greece, but then she's going to be projected at times to be a divinity that is going to get accolades as far as the great mother herself. Um, that piece is actually from modern Bulgaria, ancient Thrace. Okay. Um, I actually used it in my most recent dissertation um, because I actually study and focused on the Western Black Sea and synchronistic nature with native indigenous cults attributed to the Thracians during the period of Roman occupation. So that uh, colorization, it's actually um, a friend of mine did it named Katie Livingston, a former colleague. That's beautiful. And she colored it for me for, for inclusion in that dissertation. So, and then, and then this is a Roman version, right? Well, yeah. Um, and again, we're talking depictions. I, I'm trying to do that one off the top of my head. Um, I think this one's from the area Southern Italy, though. I don't think it's from Rome, right? Okay. I, I, again, we shouldn't have done that one off my head. Uh, yeah, no, it's not a big deal. It's not, not like we're, we're taking a test here. It's like we're just... We're well, just... It, it is because one of my colleagues is going to be watching this and go, no, Pat, that's from here <laughs> because he knows I study the Western Black Sea. And so I, my uh, my connection to uh, Italian um, depictions of, of I'm going to say Sibley to make the Latin purists happy, but Kybele <laughs> is... Um, um, in Rome, she's a late addition. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not as worried about her 
when she gets to Rome as how she was being incorporated in the Western Black Sea. Now, I've studied it. I think it's a fascinating piece of Roman history, though, because most people, if you ask who's the great mother, you, know, you ask the average Joe or Jane on the street, they're going to be, oh, obviously she has to be a fertility goddess. Well, that's actually probably not uh, Kybele or uh, Mater or Meter. That's not her role. The great mother's role, first and foremost, was protection of cities and peoples. That was her job. Her primary job was protect our home, protect this place. Um, and that's why she's transported by colonists from Miletus, um, Miletus um, on in Anatolia, again, the coast of modern day Turkey, Greek colony, it's actually a Greek city, whether or not it's a colony, we can argue about that later. Um, because it was there in the Bronze Age, and then it gets destroyed, and then it regrows, and the Greeks claim it. But all right, never. So um, a lot of colonists, a lot of colonists from that city, go into the Black Sea. They've already established the cult of the Great Mother at the city they come from, and as they establish new colonies in the Black Sea region, particularly where I study the Western Black Sea, the one of the chief deities depicted in all the iconography is the Great Mother. Um, we don't have the inclusion of Attis till much later. Addis is a late addition, um, and again, it probably comes from her Phrygian origins that her priests were either known as Attis or Atai in mm -hmm. their native language. So wait a minute, when you talk about you know sixth, seventh century, eighth century, ninth century cultic activity prior to the Lydian conquest of Phrygia, because there's things happening in in the region at the time um, when the Lydians conquer the region, there's no more kings of Phrygia. The kings of Phrygian are subjects and rule under the auspices of first the Lydians, then the Persians later. Um, Phrygia, um, she's a dynastic. She's associated with the dynastic rule of Phrygia, and it's possible that the king served as priest and may have been the Attis, or at least a ah, chief priest associated with the, themselves. With, with the dynasty, right? And that castration wow. was probably not anything original to the cultic activity. That was probably a Greek addition later. That's interesting stuff right there. And so it's so hard not to go full parallelomania with Magna Mater with right. the great, because if, I mean, let's be real. We look at ISIS depictions. She's standing in front of the lion. We look at Ishtar. She's standing in front of the lion. They all, and, and it's just, it's hard not to just be like, there has to be some sort of connection between all of them. But like you mentioned, their Demeter is different than 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 Kibale. and Demeter is a fertility goddess. She's the grain right. sort of, you know. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say fertility. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be agricultural? I would say agricultural. Yeah, and that's fertility what I meant. having a but see, fertility of the soil sometimes conflated with fertility of people, and sometimes not. And yeah, that's that's problematic as well because some fertility goddesses handle both realms, both agriculture, so to speak, and personal, like you know, among the animals. Um, in, in some cases, fertility goddesses are only agricultural, and then there's deities associated with particularly human birth and human reproduction. Wow, yeah, and so th th that's good. The point I'm trying to make is there are differences. They're not all the right. same, mm -hmm. and they have different origins. They have different purposes. They have different myths behind them, all that stuff. But but nevertheless, there are a lot of things that we can look at and say, hey, there probably might be some influence going on here iconography is something that is really important when you study ancient mythology i mean it's great to read all the original sources coming out of you know greek and roman contexts like from the second century bce and even through the second century a.d but remember the oldest stuff we have to verify stuff is archaeology and and so a right. little bit like my first master's degree was in ancient history so i studied all the books i only you know i only looked at the pieces coming out of the ground when i really had to know them because one of my instructors said archaeology confirms what we're learning in this text right um and then i said you know and then i went on my first archaeological dig in 2017 and i was hooked i'm like i got i got a master's degree i immediately went back to school and started working on another one in archaeology um and for me that was more important the, I, i'm not saying that they don't they, they go hand in hand like you need text and you need the material culture or the evidence to support it um but I, I find the the looking for the material culture, the actual evidential confirmation of a lot of what's written to be very, very, for me, it's, it's exciting. So I agree. And it is very fascinating stuff. Now we do have some information regarding what the priests were doing, the sacrifices. Right. Uh, we want, you want to play the clips? Sure. At least in Rome, right? 
Yeah, yeah. We'll start with your the clip that you made, and then we'll show the depiction from the HBO show Rome. Well, well why don't we show Rome first? Okay, then... yeah. That's, that's yeah. you think that's a better idea. I, I think know that's that, a better. Yeah, okay. I like I like that. What I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a depiction from the show HBO's Rome, and it's if you don't like blood, don't watch. Just look away for a couple minutes. It's like a minute and a half long. It's actually a great next. clip though. But it's, it's probably one of clip. if this is an accurate depiction, it may or may not be. But if it is, it's a very good one. It's one interpretation. And also keep in mind, people who drop super chats, I saw those. Thank you. And we will get to them. I'm not ignoring them. I just want to make sure we get some some stuff out. We, we're doing this presentation and hopefully we can uh, we can all, you know, go from there. All right. Great mother says no harm shall come to your boy. Good. So if you notice at the end, the priest says, the great mother says that no harm will come to your boy. So if this would have been in Latin. This wouldn't have been in English, obviously. He would have said what? Magna Mater, right? Magna Mater. Yeah. So what do you think about that clip? And do you want to go right so to your clip now? We go to my clip because I explained that. And then we'll this, talk about it. Right, sure. Perfect. Hi, today on Mad Facts with Pat, we're going to talk about what is possibly one of the most fascinating but contested and debated ritual practices that was utilized among the main ancient Romans, um, at least debated among those who study ancient Roman religion. Um, this was a very unique form of ritual sacrifice, which involved the slaying of a bull and the splattering and possibly pouring what could have been several gallons of blood onto a willing supplicant. Uh, this ritual was dedicated to the goddess Sibylle, Greek Kybele, um, and was known to the Romans as Magna Mater, or the Great Mother. Um, and this ritual was known as the Torbolium, which meant ritual killing of the bull. Now, a key part of the Torbolium was the blood. Um, and we're fortunate to have over 120 inscriptions throughout the Roman Empire commemorating the ritual, which appears to have been adopted in the early 2nd century CE. In addition to those uh, inscriptions, we have several literary accounts which um, describe various aspects of Kybele's cultic activity. What appears to have been believed by the people receiving this ritual purification um, seems to have varied quite a bit. Some refer to it as, in the inscription, as their rebirth into eternity. we have heard that before. And others are just having it done for the sake and safety of the emperor. Now, back to the blood part. What we see illustrated here is a classic depiction of the Torbolium. In this pit is the supplicant, the person that's going to be receiving the blood ritual. Above them on the platform are priests and a bull. And that platform is typically believed to have been made of wood with slats and specially designed holes in it. What would happen is the ritual would commence when the throat of the bull was slit with a knife and the contents would be ushered out forth onto the platform, which would then fall onto the supplicant, bathing them in the bull's blood, literally a baptism by blood. Now, an average bull holds 10 gallons of blood. So by sl slitting the major arteries of the neck, quite a bit of that blood's gonna come forth. And it's believed anywhere from two to three and possibly as many as five gallons of blood could be released during this ritual. 
Until a couple decades ago, that classic depiction of the Torbolium was generally believed to be how it was done. Um, but in the recent scholarship, like, for example, Mary Beard and others have offered a more limited view. Um, one of the problems with some of our accounts is they are from later Christians who seem to have over-aggrandized and polemicized the practice. And so some scholars, like Dr. Beard, have said that it probably wasn't the Torbolium pit ritual, but the blood would have been collected during the process, and then an instrument like a branch or stick or some implement would be stuck into a pool of blood, and that blood would be ritually splattered onto the supplicant. And again, it's still a lot of blood being flung onto people, but rather than having this elaborate practice where gallons of blood are poured onto the supplicant, it was a much more measured response. Now understand the use of blood in Roman rituals for purification was extremely rare, and this seems to be one of the few practices by Romans with blood used in this manner, and it was associated with a foreign goddess. Now there's all kinds of other stuff that we'll talk about with Kybele regarding ritual castration and other things later, but for now, that's been another mad fact with Pat. That is awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's get that. Okay. There we go. That was awesome. So I tried to do one of those in episode with, with, with Biddy. So yeah. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot that you threw at us there. Um, I'm particularly interested in what you said about the Christians polemicizing it. Do you want, what, what exactly do you, do you think about that? Well, they, in my opinion, we're seeing it as, a blood ritual. I think Christians polemicized it because what we'd call pagan polemics against Christianity. We're talking about many of the Christian rituals and this, you know, put it, the issue with the period is the polemics are going back and forth against each other. Um, and the Christians wanted to denounce this practice as barbaric, equating it with quote unquote magic, which again is a bad term, um, but also wanting to show and if you want to think of it, the wasteful nature of it, right? The, yeah. the, the, it, 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 there was all these different attitudes uh, towards it. I do think, though, one thing that'd be interesting, if Dr. Beard and others who are now taking what I call the conservative view, that it was like the blood was collected under the platform rather than someone bathing in it. And I can see how Christians would get this wrong. But you collect the blood, you have to have a container to collect it, cutting them on top of a board. Modern slaughterhouses work the same way, by the way. Um, you catch the bowl in a receptacle. This would allow you to actually uh, conduct a purification ritual with multiple supplicants. You could splatter blood with, let's just say, a branch on numerous people at one time. And this would allow actually a more measured way where multiple people could engage in this practice at one time, which would allow it not to be something solely reserved for the elite because a bull is extremely expensive. Um, and it, it would have made it more accessible to the Roman populace um, in general. And Kyabili was an extremely important goddess in the Roman world. The last thing I want to talk about before we get to the super chats, and then we can explore all those questions and keep continuing with this conversation is the Attis part. Now when Attis gets involved, uh, Catalyst has a Roman version of this myth in the first century BC. Mm -hmm. And there's a hymn that's written to Attis. I'll just show the hymn. This is from, this is from, this is a translation from M. David Litwa, his book, um, Found Christianities that just came out this year. And it says, Blessed one, whether born of Kronos, Zeus or Rhea, I loudly hail thee, Attis. You, the Assyrians, called thrice desired Adonis. All Egypt calls you Osiris. Samothracians call you Adamas, the Phrygians Papas, a corpse, a god, unfruitful, goat herd, green ear of harvested grain, fruitful almond born player of the pipes. Okay. Now, the reason why this is so profound is because in the second century, there is a group of Christian Gnostics in Egypt called the Nassines, N A A S S E N E S. And they have a really charismatic leader that's, we don't know his name. His name is lost in history. Right. But the, the Hippolytus and his refutation of the of the uh, heresies calls him the Nassim preacher. And apparently they were applying this hymn to Jesus, which means they were they were identifying Addis with Jesus, which would right. mean G they're they're saying Jesus is Osiris, Jesus is Donus, Jesus right. is the son of son of Zeus, all that's all that's all Jesus, which brings us to the next question. 
who was magna mater then. Well, as we were saying backstage, um, that would, if, if you're following that parallel, magna mater would have been like, the mother or companion and that would have been mary in a christian framework or if you're going back to a more jewish tradition it, possibly you could even make an association um with someone like um asherah yeah interesting and so i just think it's fascinating that people are throwing these ideas around there he call them heresy if you like sure fine fair enough but it just shows us that there were people not just people from a critical perspective, but believers that were throwing these ideas around of Jesus being like Addis. And the myth of Addis is kind of strange. He castrates himself. Now, if I'm not mistaken, didn't we were talking about this before, you saw something in the New Testament that reminds you of Addis from Jesus' standpoint. Which part is that again? Right. I, I, I believe it's from the book of uh, Matthew. I think it's 19 where Jesus makes a comment about it's better for you guys. It's talking about sexual uh, immorality. It says it's better to castrate yourselves and to live a pure life. And he's talking about ritual purification. Now, ritual castration was seen as like one of the most sacred divine acts among the priests of Kybali and others, by the way, that we know most about it in its association with Kybali. Um, But so there's some interpretations, one of which I agree with that passage in particular that um, states, I agree that Jesus is either encouraging and or stating that he had ritually either go do it yourself or I've already done it. And I think that's a pretty fair interpretation. Now, uh, apologists will say, oh, absolutely not. He's just saying that, you know, well, just read the text in the original language and you can probably do a little better with it. And then when you, when you put that side by side with the hymn to Addis, you're like, whoa, well, maybe some Christians did see it that way. Origen castrated himself and he was from Alexandria, Egypt. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. So he was in that same region, region. Mm -hmm. where there this is a popular thing that everybody's doing. Wow. And this is where Philo is too. So if you read right. Philo, mm -hmm. Phi the Philonic philosophy is like Judaism with like, you know, applying some Platonic things and saying that God is a trinity of three, a nature of three, and then d the divine heir of all things is the logos. So it's not that crazy to think that this would be a haven for these ideas, these sort of allegorical approaches to scripture. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and we don't have time to talk about divine triplicates, but like a Trinity is no new concept. Like, right. like, like divine triplicates are just. Yeah. And Philo proves that Philo proves that there were, there were Trinitarians before Christianity. Well, I, there were Trinitarians. You can depict like just triplet goddesses. Is it one good way? Yeah. Um, I mean, just, you look at triplet goddesses and then even like how gods were venerated in Rome. Um, you know, we have the Capitoline triad, right? Right, um, right, right. Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. Yeah. And the, you're the right. father, the father, mother, and daughter. It seems to be a very common trope of these trinity of these like triad, even in Egypt, you had Osiris, right. Isis, and, and Horus. Horus. Mm -hmm. And that then all, all the way down to India where they had the Trimurti. I mean, this was sort of like a, uh, a universal idea of God or gods being in, in a nature of three. So, yeah, I'm yeah. totally agreeing. With that. that makes sense to me. Uh, what, do you want to touch on anything else before we start going? Some well, with Addis, too, um, just because I want to, I, I get, like I said, I focus on the Western Black Sea, to, yeah. uh, modern Romania and, and Ukraine, by the way. Um, when we look at the former colonies uh, that were founded at um, uh in the Black Sea, Western Black Sea region, like modern Constanta, um, um, modern uh, Varna um, in Bulgaria, we we look at the ancient Greek, ancient Greek, but they existed with the Thracian and native indigenous people before that. Um, we don't see as many the conflation to Addis again. We don't see anything in the ground, no votive offerings, no inscriptions, nothing to Addis until the fourth century, mid fourth century, which is pretty late. That's three fifty BC, roughly. Um, so what do we need to do? Um, we need to go back. And we find a lot of earlier depictions of the great mother. Um, again, she's her role is as a divine protector of cities. She gets in the Black Sea. She also gets conflated, not conflated. She gets added the element of also being protector of men who board ships. Later during the Hellenistic period, she's also associated with Athena. And now we're seeing some change of her aspects, but that's later. It's like 500 years down the road 
before we start seeing how she's depicted later and in a much different way as a, a mother who also has a fertility role and all these things. But initially, she is a goddess associated solely with the protection of people and the support of dynastic rule. That's, again, we talked about the lions. Lions were associated in Lydia for an important reason. And many kingdoms in the ancient world use lions as a sign of uh, dynastic dominance, the king, so to speak. Yeah, you think of the Persian Empire with the lion as their emblem, and mm -hmm. yeah, like definitely, that's definitely a symbol of of, of what you're saying. Um, another thing I thought about too is I, I'm a reader of Pausanias, uh, as I, I think I said his name right, who is a Greek historian, geographer, geographer. Yeah, he's basically like a new Herodotus in the second century. Le less prone to bullshit than Herodotus. Herodotus, <laughs> Herodotus just made shit up whenever yeah, he didn't. Give, give him a whenever break. he didn't know, yeah. Her give but Herodotus, him, like four hundred right, BC. I, I give Herodotus a break because he's the first guy trying to right. get away from the Homer, Homer, ha, Homeric epical style, right? Yeah, sure. But he's talking about one-eyed men and gold guarding griffins and right. kind of. He also talks a lot about Zelmoxes, which you're into as right. well, which is an interesting. Which, which we don't know if he if he was right or not, but. There's some archaeology. Well, he, he makes it seem like this is a historical thing. Like yeah. Pythagoras had a guy who was following him named Zelmoxis. Who, anyways, we can, we can get into that if we have time. But um, but another I, episode. I, yeah, what I was getting at was Pausanias talks about there being a god worshipped in, um, not Thrace in uh, Eleatic, I think it was the Eleatic region. Okay, could be wrong. Whatever. Anyway, somewhere in the Greek world. Let's just all right. Let's just say that. I mean, I'm sorry. I have to. I can't be exact right now. I forgot. But anyway, somewhere in the Greek world, there was a, there was a, um, a temple, with a god called the Savior, the the Savior Baby. I think it was, and it's a image of a baby wrapped in a cloth with stars around it, and it's the Soter, the Savior, right. and so he was talking about this like. And I just, I don't know. I just, thought, I'm, I'm wondering if there's something going on with that, maybe as, as well, well as the, the, the epithet Soter was very common yeah. among, like, particularly when a god was attributed with having saved a city or a nation. If you were an Egyptian, almost every Ptolemy in the third century BCE was given the epithet Soter because they had saved the kingdom. Um, so again, being a divine being that is called the savior was nothing new in first century sure. CE Palestine. Yeah, and exactly. And, and that's the point I'm getting at is like, when I bring all this stuff up, when I talk about Julius Caesar ascending into heaven and Augustus being the son of God because of the will, I'm not yep. trying to say that Christianity is, is copying that. But what I am saying is these are things that are already around. These are ideas that are already th common know. motifs. Yeah, they're common tropes and motifs in the world. So Christianity just is like comes out of a soil that is already very ready for something like this to grow out of. It's it's not that abnormal to see. Christianity actually makes sense in the context of where it's at. The only thing that made Christianity unique, in my opinion, was that it was exclusionary and not as exclusionary as people think, particularly up until the fourth century. But that as far as a mystery cult, there's some good argument to be made that it meets all the classical criteria of mystery religion, by the way, um, is its exclusivity. Other mystery cults, you could join a second mystery cult. Now, why you'd want to, I don't know. Um, right. Some mystery cults had different, um, I guess you want to say, theologies behind them or belief systems that you would learn once you got in. But like, if you join the mystery cult of ISIS, you didn't need to join another mystery cult because she was all that in a bag of chips. Like... ISIS was the super, if you were in, uh, indoctrinated in the mystery cult and taught the secret things and received gnosis, you would know that all their goddesses are just projections of ISIS's true divinity, right? That she's a single divine feminine entity that any other, that she's, she's Hera, she's, you know, again, you have to read um, Apuleius, but you read it and you go, okay. Um, and a single divine feminine would also be, her big comp, uh, competition for this epithet would have been Kybele. Kybele would have said, no, no, I'm the great goddess. I'm the mother of the gods, right? Right. Also, and another thing about Ka the golden ass is you, you notice that there's the salvation aspect. Of exactly. Isis, which oh, is Isis just, is a salvonic deity. She, right. She's everything Jesus is, I, it, just from an Egyptian and a, a Roman Egyptian context. 
even the name is really close. <laughs> Isus and Isis, like well, it's like a male version of Isis almost. I'll, I'll just, I'll just, well, I'll, not, I'll, leave, I'll leave that to the the yeah, experts in linguistics. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. I, you know, I'm just having fun. I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just speculating here. That's all. Anyways, let's get to some super chats. Um, Natalia Emerson, thank you for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Do you think that Mary the Virgin is related to Kybele? And what about Isis? So we have no associated mythical traditions or depictions where other than the epithet of being mother, right? Uh, and a generic depiction, uh, uh, representation orally of her being mother of the gods. Um, we don't have any divine children till much later associated with Kybele. So imagine everybody's like, she's the great mother of all, including the other gods, by the way, in some mythical traditions, but just being the general mother of all things is probably the easier and safer way to go. Um, but when we get to Isis, you're getting much closer. Um, Isis is particularly to, to her depictions of um, nursing young Horus and Horus's uh, uh, symbol. Symbol that like, Horus is depicted a lot in the Hellenistic period, by the way, of being a child. Yeah. Right. So again, a wandering little godling who still looks up and has to be nurtured by his mother and then receives divine suckling. That it's not. Again, it's not a hard stretch. Yeah, um, I was just going to say the same thing. The uh, the idea of, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you might know about this. I'm just I'm just guessing, speculating here. If I'm not mistaken, there are some statues of Isis. This is not an example of that. This is just something I just pulled out of Google real quick. But that's that's just something I pulled out. But I was trying to find it real quick, but I couldn't. I think there's some examples of Isis statues being repurposed for Mary. There's some there's some scholarship on that. It's again not something I've gone too far in the weeds on, um, but there are several scholars who contend that. And the other thing too is, Isis isn't the only goddess who's a suckling mother. We have Dia Matrona, who was a popular Celtic and Germanic deity along the Rhine. Um, oh, wow. Again, there, there's all these divine feminines representations, particularly of of suckling nursing. So, I think the only thing that again I'm trying not to be uh, too argumentative, but I think the only thing the Christians did was by the 5th century, 6th century, they started covering up the Madonna's breast. You, so instead of nursing the infant Christ, she now is depicted as holding him because nursing would have been seen as sp exposing a bare breast wasn't acceptable by Christian standards at that time um, in artwork, particularly when it de dealt with the Atokos, the, the, God, the, um, the, the divine mother, the mother of God. Wow, that was great. Vaguely agnostic just became a member. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You are the best. Uh, let's see what we got. Myth Vision Podcast, Derek, showing some love to the family. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate that as well. I know there's a couple more, so let's see what we got. Mummy Vale, thank you for the super chat. Do you think that Attis is any influence of this must have been before I showed the uh yeah. this must have been before I showed the hymn. Um, you want anything you want to say to that? I, I would say in some, I would say it was to what extent we can't say exactly, but in, at least in certain regions of Christianity, I mean, again, we're talking about the Roman empire and even beyond the Roman empire. Right. Um, I think it's fair to say that in some regions he was more influential than others, but yes, he was at some degree or another influential in some of the development, particularly cultic activity. The, some right. Christians were running around castrating themselves as signs of devotion. Like, and again, Paul's going to be very belligerent about castrating themselves, uh, about people castrating themselves when he's talking about Anatolians. I believe it's in Galatians, right? Um, and that's where the cult of the mother won another region where she's the cult of the mount, mother of the mountains, where she gets the epithet Pontic mother, right? Northern part of modern day Turkey. So again, this idea that castrating yourself as an act of utter devotion and purity wasn't all that crazy in the ancient world, maybe by modern standards, but among ancient peoples, if you were really wanting to be devotion and reach a certain point of both sexual and physical purity, um, you, you did these things and some early Christians embraced it and they, and they believe that that was equally as important until it becomes outlawed. They actually, the church later councils um, in the fifth century in particular says, if you're still castrating yourself, you, you get removed from the priesthood because it was so they had to make it really problematic for priests in particular to keep doing this and adhere it to the faith. Yeah. And I was thinking about Adonis too. A lot of times, I think if I'm not mistaken, Adonis gets conflated with Addis a lot too. 
I, 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 I would agree. And I think there's like there's a lot of parallels between the Venus and Adonis myth from Ovid and the Athens. I don't know much about I, it. I, I'll be honest. I, I think I think Dr. Beard would give you an A if you were in her comparative mythology class because she would make again <laughs> having 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 myths that are similar with beings that are similar, particularly when you look at the conflation later in the Black Sea region of Aphrodite and Kybele. It makes sense but again that's the hellenistic period it's it's centuries and centuries later um and you know kybele the great mother if we go to um modern balchek uh dionysiopolis in the ancient world like that colony was founded in the sixth century bce and actually has one of the best preserved temples dedicated to the great mother the pontic mother um, um and I, I actually think uh both dr beard and uh dr bill brigitte, brigitte Bo, they both mention it like they each have a chapter about this temple right um and the, just the amount of inscriptions we have like five centuries worth of inscriptions and we can see the development of the goddess like her cultic festivals or activities um and in the ancient world the temple was abandoned um in the seventh century after a great earthquake uh in the black sea actually flooded the city all the cities of the western black sea out um and so even though it had been dismantled during the christian period it hadn't been pillaged for building materials yeah. So it had been taken apart and buried, but then not pillaged, which was really important for preserving of all this stuff. You can go there today and go to the temple. I've, I've done it. I had to jump a fence once because it was closed and I had to go inside it. But I've been there, I think, three times now. Now, I know from reading Beard and a couple other places that Augustus rededicated this temple in 3 AD, or 3 AD, I think it is. And if I'm not mistaken, they went to that location that you're talking about and brought a stone back to Rome. It was like some holy stone. And they put it somewhere in the temple and just to that, make a connection. That kind of stuff was very important. Like if you think about like the original importation of Magna Mater in her Roman context, she was brought in to protect Rome against the Carthaginians. Wow. She's brought in as a foreign deity who's like, the Romans weren't doing it because they're like, hey, there's this really cool fertility deity out in Anatolia. They said, no, no, we need a divine protectress. Now, think about what the Romans were actually doing here. They already had a deity, a female deity, who was a protector of Rome. Roma. Dear Roma. But she wasn't doing her job. <laughs> so they brought Hannibal. in... They Hannibal brought was in, kicking ass. Kicking ass. So in order to protect not just Rome, but all the cities in the region they brought in a heavy hitter uh, and it, it wasn't like they were replacing roma but they were bringing in additional divine backup um and that's why uh, magna mater is so important during that time period that's why you know you have remember that the, it again if you believe the accounts which i think are a lot of um there's some his, historical myth mythogizing during going on there but as they're transporting this cultic image this uh, statue from pergamon you know, it's going over ships and everything. They stop at Delphi, right? Delphi. And they, they talk to the Oracle there. And Oracle says, yeah, you need to go to Rome. And so not only did the Sibyllines say that it was important, it was also the Oracle at, at Delphi, right? So you have multiple holy women in this case. Like like, and they bring this cultic statue to Rome. And then Rome wins the war. So obviously they were right. Skippy. And obviously she's the most powerful goddess in the Mediterranean because she, she kicked Hannibal's ass. Yeah, don't give any credit to Scipio. It's it's all magnum. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh Robert Herring says origins, etc., might be different. But what's the same as they're all female? Wonder when Hebrews changed from a goddess to a god. Good stuff, Neil. It's a good question. Uh, what about yeah. Asher? Yeah, but I, I what I think happened was the a lot of societies were overtly patriarchal, but when you move into monotheism, you have a choice. You can be a monotheistic male centric system or female centric system. And the Israelites, ancient Hebrews, they decided, and I, they weren't monotheistic till later, but when they decided on monotheism sometime between, you know, the, the scholars debate sometime around sixth, fifth century BCE, when they pull the, when they pull that lever and make a decision, they decide to go with a male Supreme deity. And that's why they reject all the former Asherah cultic elements and all, they basically say, we no longer have a divine mother. And by the way, right. Yahweh never had a wife. And even though it's in our sacred literature, we're not going to read that part because that would take too much time. And then they um, combine El and Yahweh, which were two different gods. Right. Well, it, it was, it, I think it is a 
di divine replacement mythology because that happens sons replacing their fathers right was a very yeah. common element and sometimes they marry their I'm mothers Saturn yeah right mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then you know what I noticed if you read I think it's Joshua but I think it's also in the Torah and the Deuteronomy and stuff like that where they talk about going into Canaan and invading and you know ripping down all the poles of like Yahweh is commanding them to rip the poles of Asherah down so what happens is apologists would read that and say see they didn't worship Asherah this is before they got there BS I'm calling BS and so should you the people who are watching this because this did not get written till way later. Right. And what they're doing is they're making a mythology to explain how they got to like their their poles of Asherah were a custom of the of the Israelites until a certain period of time right. before they wrote the wrote these scriptures. Then when they write these scriptures, they're sort of perfecting their history to make everything so like a fairy tale, basically. Like, yeah, we came in and we destroyed the poles of Asherah. Well, I think it's rather than saying fairy tale, I think it's culturally explanative, right? right. It's It's just like the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is a great story on how do we explain that we speak a language and everybody else speaks a different language than us? Well, we obviously are chosen by God. So our language is God's language, by the way, in the original right. Hebrew, that's how it reads, right? But when you're having to explain why there's so many languages, if there's one people descending from God, you have to come with a story. And Babel makes sense. Babel, even though the Tower of Babel, if it existed, was possibly an actual historical incident where different different um uh neo assyrians built um temples great temples dedicated to uh, deities actually biddy did a great tiktok on this um but th this is the kind of thing like you have to have a explanation on why there's more than one language and creating a story where your god comes down and makes all the languages as a punishment is what they say not only are we better than our neighbors we are we now have a, a explanation of how this happened rather than saying you know um something else like every god gave their their language of people you if from a monotheistic worldview you can only have one deity that's um explanative in that system makes sense <clears throat> gaius julius windex one of my uh good friends of the show what about the mother of earth um if we're talking about Rhea in a greek context um um later magna mater and kybali are going to get conflated with her as well um, here it is that's, right here mother earth is that mate? I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. Well, so there are there are deities associated with Earth herself. If you want to, you know, uh, the concepts often known as Gaia, right? Um, right. The, these are these are primordial realities in the ancient world. Like your planet that you're standing on is a deity unto itself. Um, you know, there are people that still believe this concept today. You know, and, and they typically fall into a, a belief system known as like Gaia theory, right? That there's some divine element in the earth even to this day but in the ancient world that was a very common concept what's interesting about that is if you go to hesiod which was like the he's the one basically writing the genesis story for the for the greek mythology i, right. I mean i guess it's like not as clear yeah. but, but he does have this sort of like in the beginning there was chaos and then and then i think he says gaia or no he says sky or Enos, right. gaia and then so forth right so He's actually, there is a Gaia that it's a goddess. It's not just like the same as all the other mother goddesses. It is a specific deity from Hesiod's uh, pantheon. Yeah. Right. And so when, you know, works and days and theogony, right? The two works that are attributed, like he's explaining both of them. I think it's important to remember that the gods could be conceptual. Like, like those earlier gods were great templates upon which things were built, right? The sky the earth now if you think about it what's that say about zeus who's just a deity associated with divine air celestial realm right god well is he not as cool well no because these are the, the gods were the templates upon these earlier depictions are also but they're also divine beings themselves but these are typically the the con everything had a divine concept in antiquity you know if you want to say again if you want to get into platonism too deep everything had a spiritual and material form right that was that's the basis of platonics. That's why we have souls now in Christianity today is because the Platonists and the Neoplatonists went, hey, we have to have this this, this multifaceted view um, of everyone's being. And the Greeks saw that that way. And the, that was their default worldview. Yeah, and everyone has a perfect version of their self somewhere. Perfect form of everything. Right, that, else. right. like yeah. your, your carbon copy in the closet that you pull out in case of emergency because that's always, that's like your template you want to aim for. Yeah, interesting, interesting. 
Uh, here's the next one. Thank you for that super chat. Yakuvi, it's rain. Thank you for the super chat. Any connection to the Jewish sprinkling of the blood of the lamb? Oh, yeah. Good one. So in it's probable. Um, I don't, again, this is going to be argued between what area of the Eastern Mediterranean you're studying, but ritual sprinkling of blood for purification probably existed earlier than the accounts that are attributed to the ancient Israelites, probably go back to the Bronze Age and probably the early Bronze Age. Um, there's a lot of scholarship on it that falls outside my area of expertise, but it's it the connection may have been that just it was a system, but Magna Mater's depiction, particularly in the in the in the Roman context, was much later. So it the Jew the Jewish custom already originated when the Romans had adopted when the Romans had adopted it uh, under their worship of uh, Magna Mater. So maybe maybe not. And I think you might be able to argue that it might be an other it might be the other way around. Like the, this is just like a I don't know how do you how do how do I how do I phrase this, but like the sort of sacrifice rites that you see across the globe in every religion right. seems to be some norm, not just coming from like they're not all borrowing from the Jews. That's not happening. No, like but the Jews are doing what everyone else is doing. They're just doing it in their own different way. Right. And sometimes what they're doing is they're preserving a tradition that falls out of practice in one area. And so it's not preserved. Um, sometimes they're, I don't want to say reinventing, but their their customs and practice are personalized as an ethnicity. So what I'm saying is um, ancient ancient Jews wanted to make something their own. So they changed it slightly. So they weren't doing the next, the same thing the next door neighbor was doing because that in the ancient world, having an, many people were ethnocentric in their worldview, they saw themselves as us and everybody else as them. And they wanted to be special. Just go on Twitter. Everybody wants to be fucking special. And it was no different in the ancient world. Um, and you know, these groups, part of being special was having cults and rites that made you special. Same thing with mystery cults, by the way, in the ancient world. Once you got into a mystery cult, you were in a special in-group. Even in Greek society, you were someone who possessed gnosis. And I'm going to keep saying that because your channel. Like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. important. The fact that you could look at another member who was a member of the cult and a mystery cult and say, yeah, we know the secret knowledge that even the people that we live with and around, we have the special in-road. So, um, um, yeah, if you read the, the hymn to Demeter or even like the scholarship surrounding the hymn to Demeter, they were saying that when people who took part in this right yep. would no longer fear death because no. they saw they saw the real heaven and they knew yeah. that they were saved and it was um, a form of salvation. Yeah, now, those city mysteries like Hugh Bowden, um, who I talked about a little earlier, he actually wrote a book, Mystery Religions of, of, of the Greco Roman World. Um, like he really talks about this. Like when you came out of Eleusis. You were you were born again we're because now you didn't have to worry about death because everybody else those people they're screwed. That's they correct. get they get like way bad afterlife, but you're getting a salvation better. Than us. I, now the Greeks didn't have the same concept of hell at the period like, but but you getting to be like just hanging out in the afterworld is like a listing spirit versus me sitting around on a beautiful island with all my friends and family eating, drinking, and being merry all day. They're basically one's heaven, one's hell. For all yeah, you might as well just label it that way. Yeah. But but you're right. That's the that that is a that is the feel. That's the message I get when I read about the illusiony mysteries. Is that they literally were convinced that Same. they got initiated into a secret right that got them saved into some. They called it a Lucius, the the fields of a Lucius, which is not the same as Hades. It's a different place, like you just said. Well, it's, it's a little different. The Ellicinian mysteries, you know, when, they, when they're talking about like where they go, um, you know, depending on if you want different degrees in the Greek um, afterlife, so to speak. But basically, uh, even Hades was just a place you hung out. But, the you know, if you were exalted, you got to go to the special little in club. It was like, hey, we live in a town and there's a special little club for everybody else. But I, I will say, if you look at like, I, the mystery religions associated with ISIS, the mystery religion uh, associated with um, um, Eleusis, that's, you know, um, Demeter and Persephone. Um, you start looking at these cults and you start seeing how they were reflective on exaltation in the afterlife. If you took Judaism and mystery cults, Greco-Roman and other 
cultural mystery cults, and you put them in a blender and you put puree on, and then you drink it, you'd have Christianity. I, I've been saying that forever. I, that's That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. And maybe sprinkle a little bit of... Uh... A little bit of Zoroastrian stuff in there. Well, well you, like I said, you got to bring in stuff from all over the place because yeah, this because is you, you, on top. That's all. And what's funny is like angels, Judaism borrowed that from <laughs> High Queen. Um, Jessica's got it coming in. Like, just yeah, the dame, the demons, the demons, right. and the angels comes from Zoroastrians, right? Right. Well, well the hierarchy, the angelarchy, right? Yeah. That we have now angelology, right? That that hierarchy within angelic systems. That's an import into Judaism. Yeah, then I Judaism think. doubles down with it. I mean, all you have to do is start reading like the Greek magical papyri. Again, if you ever have a chance to read those texts, please do it because they throw every God and goddess and major demon and devil. It's, it's the only place you can read about Jesus Christ, Moses, Osiris, Isis, Hecate, every, every pantheonic system is represented because you're doing magic. And when it comes to magic, sometimes you gotta, you gotta make sure you make every God or goddess happy and placate them. Oh yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and then I noticed another thing real quick before I go to the next one, is there is a passage in the Zen of Vesta, where Zoroaster out in the wilderness and he gets tempted by Anger Manu, and Anger Manu's like, "Listen, dude, just drop what you're doing, and yeah. and and I'll give you the boon of all boons." He says, "What's the, he says? This is the boon of all boons. You have the boon to rule all the nations, just like the murderer does." And a, a Horam or a Zor. Zoroaster just ignores him and starts praying, praising Ahura Mazda. And it, it looks like the passage of Matthew, where Matthew's in the desert and Satan, the devil, comes out. And by the way, Anger Manu was known as the devil. In, right. Like yeah. the evil, the evil one or the, yeah. the, the dark, you know, kind of the we, we get again, we get that whole like from Manichaeism and, and, and Persian influence. That's where we get like light, light and dark in Christianity. That whole right, that dual, yeah. Yeah, that dualism, that that again. We can blame Augustine later, but you know, he's, yeah, 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 sure. He's a he's a failed Manichaean. <laughs> Robert Herring says it's easy. Neil, Second Temple Judaism was a fraud. <laughs> uh, well, that's not an unfair statement when you look <laughs> at what happened to the cultic system at the time and the heavy influence that Hellenization had on it. Yeah, the the, the, the so yeah. I mean, Herod was basically just a puppet for the Romans, just like. Well, yeah. But, you know, I mean, the second total period. Now, I, I, I don't look at it just like there were a lot of people that were liking the Greek stuff. Sure. There were, you know, there it's always seemed like, oh, the Greeks were bad. Well, the, the, the Greeks were there were a lot of people going, yeah, these Greek people are really smart and we're going to be hanging out like them. And we kind of like having, you know, gymnasium, maybe once a gymnasium like, yeah. when the Romans show up, they're like. You mean we're not going to have you know they're going to build latrines? We're going to have sanitation and aqueducts and all these things, like Greek, Greek and Roman cultural influence. And by the way, same thing during the earlier periods with the Persians when they when they came um, westward. These were these with a lot of these empires brought innovation and stability to these regions as well, allowing them to funny, build infrastructure. It's funny that you said that because when you read about Her or you read about Pontius Pilate and Josephus before it even gets to the whole Jesus passage. It's talking about he's bringing in uh, standards, which are like those like things with the golden uh, yeah. eagle on them. And they're like flipping out about that. I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. that's weird. I guess he slaughters a bunch of people after that. And then it's like and then he brings in aqueducts of water. And I'm like, wait a minute. Who is the bad guy here? This seems like he's not. He's like trying to make the place a little bit better. You're trying to bring water that to them. And they're like, no, we hate you. And he has to like it's just like who's well, the bad one here? I don't know. The population in ancient Palestine was diverse culturally and politically. When right. when Pilate walks in and has the image of the emperor, by the way, which and the eagles, which would be covered up sometimes when they came in, um, the Pilate was making a statement. Now, Pilate may have been a statement like, I've just been given my appointment by the emperor. I'm not going to disrespect the emperor coming into this place. And he may have said he may have been doing it to affirm the pro-Roman elements, by the way. And he may have just made a a calculated mistake. Um, but I think he was doing it because a pilot from numerous sources was an a-hole. He didn't, he, he was, he was your, I mean, very few, like when we, when we read Josephus, right. Very few Roman governors and pilots, one of a short list, I think there's only two or three that are ever removed for bad behavior as governor. It's like, like he's on a very short list of assholes. Yeah. Yeah. You got a good point there. 
I think there's one more super chat. Ted Francis says, what is the myth of Addis? I don't think we did say what the, what it is actually. So Addis is the divine lover of Kybele who um, falls out of favor of the goddess through acts of infidelity. Um, and he is ritually cat. Well, he's castrated um, and then dies of his wounds in a way it, it parallels Adonis in many ways. I mean, the lover of a Ven of Venus. Right. Yeah. So, um, but Addis, the, the term Addis probably refers to the Phrygian priests and it was probably either can directly related. Like it may have been a title that the dynastic head, the King held or a chief priest in service to the dynastic King. Right. So chief priest of the cult of um, Meder, um, um, we'll just call her the mother Phrygian mother. They, they may have had that title. And then later what happens is Greeks and are trying to incorporate this system. And they're like, well, they don't have Kings. Like Greeks don't have Kings. It's, it's like, so who's the Addis? Well, Addis is actually from, you know, some couple Greeks sitting around a campfire drinking and they go, well, who's Addis now? Well, Addis isn't the King. Well, it's divine being. Well, who is he? He's this guy who was a lover. And that's why the priests have to castrate themselves or whatever's going on in the castration was probably a Greek addition as well or at least later, not to the earliest foundations of the cult. We we don't find in Phrygia, the earliest accounts or archaeological evidence don't seem to support the castration element of the cultic activity. Interesting. And another thing I was thinking about too is the word for mother in, in Sanskrit is mati. Right. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is when you look at mater being a, a goddess from ancient Phrygia, which, by the way, if you look at Gebekli Tepe and these places like Hewitt, these are the oldest places that we know of right. in the world. Like, of there might be some people who argue only, only because we haven't found the others yet, right? Like, exactly. No, exactly. I agree with that, hundred percent. But like, the point I'm making is, if there's a language connection between people living all the way in India and people living all the way in Greece and Spain and Italy, then I would say this might be one of the oldest gods goddesses that survives not oldest of all time but that survives into the you know antiquity i think anthropologists really have spent a lot of time thinking about this i think attestations of a divine feminine and a divine father figure are the earliest concepts now other beings as well gods of the winds things like that but having this divine pairing that there it seems to be very common it's it's i, I don't want to say ubiquitous because it goes outside my area of expertise but at least in the mediterranean the divine that there is a divine male and female progenitor and that their act if you want to call it consummation or forced consummation results in the beginning of things is not is not uncommon and seems to be prolific and so ancient peoples they personally, they're like, hey, how do we make things? Well, we make babies. Well, the gods made everything by having sex. Okay, makes sense. Not, It's not a big stretch. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a good way to explain yeah. it, actually. Yeah, and 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 Carl in the audience has made like a dozen great points. I, I just, um, yeah, you're he was right. talking about proto, proto Indo European, right? Like these are, these are the kind of ideas that are important for imagery. Um, these, these are important to remember that these concepts, these terms, like Dem Meter, right? She's a mother. Meter, um, you know, Dio, Mater, too. Mata, right? These, these are, right. These are the other things that, like, when you start thinking about Dios Pater, Jupiter, Godfather. You, you, you're, you're Whoa. just, you're just, you're <laughs> killing yourself and blowing I your just mind. Blew my own mind right there. You got Dio Mater and then Theos Pater, mother and Godfather and mother and mother. Oh my God. That's crazy. Language is crazy. Language is crazy. And the important thing to remember is these concepts were fairly ubiquitous and how even in different regions of Anatolia, you had different, like, you know, different in Northern Turkey today, the cult would have been, was more associated with Pontic, the Pontic area. But then in Phrygia, she was, you know, the mother of mountains, right. Or the mountain. And, and, and again, this concept of divine mother seemed to be regionally important. The Greeks felt very important about bringing her in. And again, when the Greeks import Kybele into Athens, for example, they're importing a very already Greek version because it's been filtered through the Greek, the Greeks living in the Western um, portion of um, Anatolia, but they're still bringing her in to be protective. 
<laughs> you know, this is her, her role is protective. Now, last time I checked, the deed that's responsible for protecting Athens is Athena. Yeah. But it's also this additive element that there was a great mother who would come into your city and help protect it in addition to the other gods and goddesses. That's crazy because it's not about just being a female goddess. It's about, mm -hmm. like you said, it's this is a different role, a different aspect. It's something completely separate than, oh, it's just a female goddess. No, this is something specific here. Sure. And that's what they that's what they really believe, which is fascinating, by the way. Uh, Saber Basawicht, thank you for the $5 super chat. Appreciate seeing you. Good to see you. Uh, I think that might be it, unless one more. Okay, okay we have one that just popped up, Constellation Pegasus. Did the ancient Indians and Hindu religion believe on a flat earth? I think so. I'm so, guessing, but I'm not sure. Constellation Pegasus, that stumps me because i that's outside my area of expertise. I, I'd be guessing, and I'm not going to guess. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I could, but I could be wrong. I thought, I think I someone showed me a model of the Kali Yuga cycle, and they were showing like in the middle was like earth, and it was like a flat disc. Like, But there could have been somebody just making some their own version i don't know i could i could be wrong like i'll i'll plead what you said I don't, i'm not an expert in that i would love to have somebody on talk about that it's a good question though but you know i'm trying to give you something you know you yeah yeah it, yeah, so. that, that. yeah. <laughs> bitty buddha with the lols and the wows <laughs> and yep. i think that's it and we have yeah. a show this sunday so oh yeah that's gonna be day. awesome that's gonna be on bitty buddha channel I'm going to put the link in the description right now. Actually, I'll put it on the top comment. I'll just pin it right there because there'll be more people watching this later. Most of my people watch it later. I get more people watch it later than, than live, which is cool. It's fine. I yeah. I get it. Everyone has their own life, you know. But and um, if, you, yeah. if you have a question or comment, you know, um, I'll follow this for a while, uh, this episode. And if you have questions for me, ask. Um, you can you can contact me through uh, Bitty Buddhist channel as well. Um, I'm not going to I, I'm not going to say I'm going to answer every question because sometimes the the um, uh, the trolls will follow you, but I'll, I'll, if, if you have a genuine question, I'll be more than happy to exchange emails with you and engage in dialogue or gauge on a Discord conversation. Um, yeah, but I had a great time, and if you want to invite me back again, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. I just want to real quick, while we have a second or two, I just want to share my screen one more time and show people where to go to find that. Here we go. Yes, this is where you want to go. Make sure you go there and subscribe. Hit the bell. Can you see my, my, my mouse right now? Yep. Hit that bell just like I'm doing right there. And you will be notified when Pat is going live. And you'll be able to get some more knowledge just like you're getting right now. So, <laughs> And and sometimes it's pseudo-knowledge, but we'll, we'll take it, right? Yeah, we, you know, and we speculate too. And that's the thing. We have fun with it. We don't, we don't, we're not all knowing. We have to guess sometimes. Right. And, and, you know, use the evidence you have to the best of your ability. Exactly. That's what I would say. Exactly. All right. And uh, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.